Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to another sermon review. I'm Michael from the Honest Youth Pastor YouTube channel, the channel that helps believers use biblical discernment in all aspects of life. My favorite way of doing that, by the way, is this right here. Walking through sermons, looking for three specific things. One, do they read the scripture? Two, do they exegete the scripture using context and culture? And three, do they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Those are the three things we look at every single time we do a sermon review. So if you're new here, that's what we're going to do here. If you want to watch previous sermon reviews, you can do that. Link for the playlist in the description below, as well as just going to the page and looking through that playlist. Now, today we're going to be looking at Talon Michael. No clue who this person is, but apparently they have 5 million subscribers on YouTube and are the son of a pastor somewhere, I think, in Virginia. I don't know. You guys send these people in. I don't know who they are. Now, this particular sermon that he's giving is at a Fresh Fire conference in uh, back in 2023. It was day one. He apparently promotes himself as an evangelist. Now, as always, the full link for the video we're going to be commentating on is in the description below. Now, if you want to start where I'm going to start, it's going to be an hour and four minutes in. <laughs> it's a two hour and 33 minute video. We're going to start an hour and four minutes in. I have no clue how long Talon goes because I've not watched this before. So we could be in for quite a treat. That being said, let's go ahead and hop into it because I don't know what's going on. I have watched the first I do want to let you know, I have watched the first few seconds of this video to kind of, you know, obviously catch up and find out where he starts preaching. Uh, we're going to watch a promo video for him. It's the, the church plays the promo video for him in case you get, don't know who he is. So it gives us a little intro into who he is as well. The quality is kind of terrible uh, as far as audio, but we'll get over it. Um, also, one, one quick thing too. If you want to uh, download our free PDF guide, uh, sermon review guide. That will be in the description below as well. Just letting you know there. Some people have found that incredibly helpful. You can read the reviews on that. So let's hop over to the sermon review screen. Apparently, Taylor Michael, a social media guru, teaching you how to do social media things. All right, let's hop into it and see what Taylor is going to offer us today at day one of the Fresh Fire Conference. Okay, let's let's get it. Immersed in the profound journey of evangelist Taylor Michael Seaman, in 2020 he birthed the Revival Way Ministries, a beacon of faith. His evangelistic mission began three years prior, touching over 160 million souls with the gospel. Tens of thousands have committed their lives to Jesus, inspired by his call, a call that resonates with unyielding strength, a call to shake the nations. Join him as he continues to illuminate the path. Hallelujah. So please join me as we welcome Evangelist Taylor once more. Well, hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Are you happy to be in the house of God this morning? He looks like a Joel Olstein esque fellow, isn't he? Hello. Hey, good morning. Glory to God. What an honor it is to be here this morning. And uh, I was just thinking, you were talking about African time. I have a lot of African friends. I have some African, South African friends that are on staff with me. And uh, it took me a while to learn because I'd say, hey, are, are you coming? And they'd say, yes, I'm coming. I'm coming now. And it would be 20, 30 minutes. And, and, and I'd say, okay, I, there's something. I caught The next day, are you coming? Yes, I'm coming now, now. And it was like 10 minutes. And then it... it Hey, are you coming? I'm coming just now. And that, so I learned African time. And uh, what an honor it is to be here. While you're standing, give a mighty hand clap to two of Virginia's greatest pastors. I'm very thankful to be here. Okay, if you're watching the video version, just so you know, this whole focusing issue that they have, it's annoying to me too. If you're listening to the audio version... You got nothing to worry about because you won't be, your eyes aren't going to be completely, I mean, in the last three seconds, we're just, technology. What an honor it is to be invited and people don't understand how important it is in these last days to have on fire pastors that are full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? So one more time, give another hand clap to your amazing pastors. 
morning. You can be comfortably seated. I'm very happy to be here this morning. This is going to be a great week. And I was seeing even this morning when I was praying, I, normally the Holy Ghost won't tell me what. Okay. <laughs> can I, I just need to stop for a second. If you are on the tech team, <laughs> uh, like I have to describe this for the people that may be listening. There is, we have a, a front, like a, a, a camera that is facing toward the podium, but in the shot, we have a television hanging from the ceiling <clears throat> that has now created an infinite loop. Um, look, I, I uh, there's companies, <laughs> there's companies that will help you do a better job at, at, at um, media stuff or just use your eyeballs. What I'm preaching on right away. But uh, the, the Holy Ghost spoke to me this morning when I woke up and he said, I want you to preach on divine healing and miracles tonight. So I want you to know this morning's going to be powerful, but the Lord wants to heal bodies tonight. So come for this morning, but come back to, tonight in Jesus name. Can you say amen? One thing, I guess, before I get into my message, I'm so happy. I really hope that we don't. There's Oh, visually, there's so much going on here that is so distracting. <laughs> we have a television with an infinite loop in the picture. We have a literal fire alarm above the cross. It's huge. It's red. Like, it's not even tried to be hidden. We've got this screen over here with an 80s techno just spinning triangle. I don't have a clue what these sweeping lines are on the front stage. And then we have these bright purple lights that are just LEDing us in the eyeballs. There's so much here visually that is unhelpful and distracting. Oh, my brain. It's, it's, I, I'm sorry. That was a moment. <laughs> Let's just get back into it. But do you come on. Look at everything that's happening here. Did, does no one else, did nobody set all of this equipment up and go, like, who, who was like, this is good. This is great. I love it. It's fantastic. This, this is top tier. The, you have not turned into an American church. I am so happy that I came into an African church this morning because Africa still has the fire of God. Can you say amen? One thing, and I'm going to tell you this, this is just a testament of having amazing pastors because all over America, you know what happens when people plant African churches in America? They'll end up like They'll do like all the super soft, lukewarm American Christianity things, but not in this church. I can tell the fire of God is in this church this morning. So I'm very happy that you have not turned into a Western American, North American church. Keep the fire. Keep that same fire that, that is in Africa. Don't, even when I was in the, the green room, I could hear everybody, ra ba 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 se de 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 you could hear African deep, powerful tongues, which the American church has lost a lot of that. But I believe the Lord's bringing it back in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? So we're going to go with maybe. So again, I don't know anything about Talon. Uh, so we're going to go with just what he's saying so far is that he's probably charismatic. Uh, man, my chair is so squeaky. Uh, I'm talking about production quality over here. Uh, so he seems to be... Um, Probably of the charismatic theological background seems to be at least. This is the thing. If you know anything about revival history, there were great men and women of God that were sent to Africa on a mission, like the great John G. Lake, like the great Reinhard Bonnke. That the Lord raised up mighty men of God in North America to send them as missionaries to the continent of Africa. And what happened was, this is what I believe is happening right now. Because America got soft, the Lord will not forget America. And God is raising up mighty women and uh, men and women of God in Africa and sending them back to America to bring the same fire that was there over here. You can even see it. Like Dr. Rodney Howard Brown. How many of you know Pastor Rodney Howard Brown? Okay, yeah. So he's definitely charismatic. Um, I haven't ever done one on Rodney Howard Brown. I don't even know if he's on the list. Um, from what I've seen, and I'm just going to say this, these are just clips. Dude's a little crazy. That's just what I've seen from the clips. Yes, Dr. Rodney Howard Brown. 
the River Church down in Tampa, a mighty evangelist, raised up in South Africa, and the Lord said he's going to America. He was called to carry the fire to America. It wasn't just meant to stay in Africa. So Africa surely shall be saved. But I believe in this last day, in this last hour, America shall be saved. Can you say amen? So I'm very happy to be in a, a genuine African church. It just feels like home. It feels like the fire of God is welcome here this morning. All right, go ahead. Get your Bibles with me this morning. Why are there two nicer chairs in the front and the other chairs are not as nice? That's just something. So, hey, so here we go. We're about to get in the Bible. Now, heads up, I won't have my screen where I can mark up the Bible today that... Uh, my iPad is dead, but we are going to encourage you to turn to whatever scripture that he turns to so we can follow along. So listen closely, and then we'll turn there. And we're going to go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew, the 24th chapter. When you're there, you can say amen. amen. Matthew 24. This is Jesus teaching about the signs of the end times. One thing you must know about the day and the hour that we're living in is it's not enough to just play church. People can't just keep checking off the box and, oh, yeah, we go to church on Sunday morning. Yeah, hey, I'm a super good Christian. I even go on Sunday night. It's not enough to just check the box on checked box Christianity because Jesus said that there's specific signs that you have to keep your eye out for. And he said, when you see these signs come to pass, he said, the end is near, even at the gates. Meaning that if you see these things start to happen, get yourself ready, because Jesus is coming back. And these are the signs that he gave. The disciples asked him, what are the signs? Matthew 24, starting in verse 3, halfway through the verse, they said this, and what will be the sign at your coming and at the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Everybody say deception. deception. The Bible says one of the greatest signs in the last days will be great deception. It even says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, there will be a form of godliness, but people will deny the power. Meaning there's going to be a form of people that go to church, but they'll deny that same power is the word dunamis. Where's that word dunamis used? Acts chapter 1 verse 8. When Jesus said, surely the Holy Ghost will come upon you with power. So what it means is that in the last days, there will be churches all over the world that will be deceived. They will have a form of godliness, but they will deny the power of the Holy Ghost. And he says, don't be deceived. Someone say, I won't be deceived. I won't be deceived. The best thing you can do in these last days and hours is to be plugged into an on fire church and get in the Bible feed on God's Word just like that song we were just singing up there it's my daily bread Jesus said I shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Father so when you keep an eye on the end times and the signs that Jesus gives it eliminates deception it eliminates the ability for you to get stuck going in the same direction everybody else going. It eliminates the ability for you to end up like every other American church. What happens is when you stay in God. This is very much a, he had mentioned it a lot, but this isn't like unity of believers. This is very much like, uh, you're the only church. Keep it holy. Keep it on fire. Don't become like all these other churches. So let's, when we get into it, we want to read the context right now. He starts halfway through chapter three. Let's go ahead, or verse three, let's go ahead and start at verse one in chapter 24. It says, Jesus left the temple and was going away and his disciples came to a point, uh, came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be torn down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, or the Messiah. 
and they will lead many astray, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, by, uh, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines on the earth, uh, famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are but the beginnings of the birth pains. Now, it's really important to note, this is why church history is really good to know. The early Christians in 69 AD, right before 70 AD at the fall of Rome, see these things surrounding them happening. So there's, there's Rome is coming against Jerusalem. There's a lot of political unrest. There's a lot of uh, war. There's, uh, Rome is about to shut off everything around Jerusalem so that the people will starve inside. And the Christians actually leave the city and they flee based upon Jesus's words uh, here at the Olivet Discourse. And so they leave the city. This is actually something that causes later on a lot of strife between Jews and Christians, uh, or Jews and Jewish Christians, because they they feel like the Jews feel like the Jewish Christians uh, uh, just abandoned them to the Romans. They flee out of the city. And so they see this, Jesus' words here about the temple being destroyed and all of these things happening, as they 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 read or they they remember these words from Jesus and they flee Jerusalem before the fall. And so it's very interesting again that this is where hermeneutics and exegesis all come into play because what Taylor's doing here is reading a modern context on top of Jesus' words, whereas early Jewish Christians especially would have seen Jesus' words here fulfilled at the fall of at the fall of Jerusalem. And so, I mean, this again at verse 8, all these are but the beginnings of birth pains. And so what you have are early believers looking at Jesus' words about this specifically and seeing them fulfilled in the the fall of Jerusalem. Also with the many, you know, messiahs coming after, there were a lot of, um, especially leading up to 70 AD and a little bit after, uh, you have a lot of like smaller Jewish rebellions. Some of those, there are people that are claiming to be the messiah or the Christ, right? Um, most, most of them are just uprisings against Jerusalem and their oppression. And so you see the early believers reading these words or remembering these words from Jesus and seeing those as fulfilled at the fall of Jerusalem as just the beginnings of the birth pains. And so we always have to remember this, that most of the time you're reading the Bible through a very modern lens of events around you, whereas when we understand church history, uh, it helps us at least view things in a way that I think is, 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 is how the original author, in this case Matthew, is intending us to view them. Uh, this is why you should also read, again, these, these, these writings from the early church fathers are not inspired by any means, but they are helpful for us to at least get some sort of context about how they were viewing those verses and acknowledge the fact that if we're not careful and we, we don't do, you know, we don't utilize hermeneutics and we don't do good exegesis, that we are apt to read things into the scripture that aren't there. I mean, everybody and their brother every 50 years is like, this is the last days, don't be a lukewarm church. Okay, well, we're always living in the last days, and there's always a fear of becoming a lukewarm church. So the idea, other than, you know, here are all the signs, you know, don't be the bad guys, just be faithful to Jesus, I think would be a more accurate um, message for people. God's word, God's fire stays in your belly. Can you say amen? amen? So he said, don't be deceived. And he says in verse six, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. Someone say, I'm not troubled. Here's the great thing about the end times. You don't have to be troubled. Many people, they, they hear Jesus is coming back. They hear there's a tribulation coming. They hear, oh, my, all these things are going to happen. Ah! And they start, they start crying. They start freaking out. They, you ever seen the, the shows on, like, YouTube and stuff? Doomsday preppers. You guys ever seen that? You guys know what a doomsday prepper is? Where they build underground bunkers and they store AK-47s and canned tuna and top ramen for the last days when all hell breaks loose on the earth. Like they're going to shoot everybody that comes to steal their tuna fish or something. You don't have to be like that. I said you don't have to be like that. When you know the Lord Jesus and you know who you are in Christ, the Bible says you don't have to be troubled because you know your Redeemer lives. You know that your position is not stuck here on this earth, but Jesus is coming back to rapture you up with the glorious... This dude in the orange shirt is like just not, 
not vibing. <laughs> he doesn't look like he wants to be there. <laughs> he doesn't want to hear it. Like, he's not reacting to anything. His bride, can you say amen? amen. Say, I won't be deceived. I won't be say, I won't be troubled. Yeah, you don't have to be troubled. He said, see that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Somebody say, not yet. Not yet. Just because these signs start to happen doesn't mean that the end is yet. In fact, it's just a sign that the end is near, but the end is not yet. It says in verse 7, look at this. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of sorrow. Somebody say the beginning. So what this means, Jesus likened it unto birthing pains. He said when these things start to happen, these are birthing pains that prove that we're in the last days. He, how does birth work? I've never given birth, obviously. I'm a man. There are only two genders. I know we're living in 2023 and people are very confused about that. But it's very, I, I like how someone once said it. There is those with spout and those without. You have man and you have woman. Can you say amen? So, <laughs> that's funny. Um, <laughs> you would think it's crazy that you even have to teach on that. That I have to like remind you, you're a boy or you're a girl. But it's true that it's people are going crazy these days it's just a sign of the end times so jesus likened it unto birthing pains so how many of you have ever given birth to a child all of you have children awesome so when you give birth to a child how do birthing pains work they don't get weaker and further apart as they happen no the contractions get stronger and closer together so jesus said these signs will be like birthing pains what that means because someone always says well brother talen you know there's always been wars there's always been famines there's always been pestilences why am i supposed to think that now jesus is coming back well because jesus said it'll be like birthing pains he said this is just the beginning of sorrows the birthing pains means that although there's always been wars there's always been signs of wars they're going to get more severe and stronger together as the lord comes back so he okay so this again is why it's really important to i guess i should preface it with this you're going to hear people preaching on end time stuff a lot and it's very important to understand that historically you have literally lived in the most peaceful time ever in history now that's not to say that what Jesus is saying here about birthing pains and Talon's whole, they get closer together, the closer you get to the birth, isn't true. But as far as, again, looking at it as an early believer, you have a lot of events. You have three major persecutions within uh, from 70 AD at the fall of Jerusalem all the way up to 300 where, I mean, you have Constantine, uh, Constantine comes along 325, but from 70 to 300, you have three major persecutions of Christians that do get worse over those, those, uh, those different times of different emperors. And so for them, again, understand, in every time, like you said, there's been war. That doesn't mean we don't continue to look for the coming of Jesus. That just means when we preach on this passage or the end times, we just view it as the early church did. Jesus could come at any time. Are these signs that he's coming? Maybe. What does that mean for us? That just means we should be continually faithful and persevere understanding that he's in control and whatever happens, terrible or great, we should persevere through it, glorifying the name of Jesus. And so like, this is where like messages like this, I don't know how, you know, long he's going to be on this point, but that's where messages like this, you're just kind of like, okay, great. What is Jesus actually trying to prepare them for? Well, you have to understand the context, which is why we read verse one, when Jesus left the temple and was going away, when his disciples came to point out to him the building of the temple, but he answered them. And again, I guess we should read a little bit further. Um, we could read back further in verse 20 or in chapter 23, but the idea is that he tells them the whole conversation is about um, the coming. And so the disciples are asking him a very specific question, and he's giving them a hint of what is going to happen. Primarily, he's telling them there are going to be people that come along, and they're going to try to deceive you. Don't worry about that. Verse 4, And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And if you hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. So these things are 
these have to happen, but the end is not yet. Um, verse nine, I don't know if he'll get to, so this is where we're at. Then they will deliver you up to true, uh, uh, to tribulation and to put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and many will lead many astray. And because of lawlessness, and because lawlessness will increase, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved, and the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will will come. So we'll see if he gets that far. But the point is, he says, this is what's going to happen. This is what happened to you. This is what is going to happen as a result of what happens to you. But don't worry, the gospel is proclaimed anyway. Stay faithful and God will be glorified. And so this isn't a, a list of all the things to look for. Okay. It's just saying that, hey, these will happen. This is going to occur. People will fall away. You need to persevere and stay faithful. Let's see if he gets that far. He says, keep your eyes open. Don't be deceived. Don't be troubled, but don't be deceived. The Bible says you must work while it is day, for surely night cometh when no man can work. So now is the time of the church. Now is the time to get the fire of God's spirit in your inner man, to get anointed with the Holy Ghost and power, and to bring God's word to a generation. Can you say amen? This is the time and the hour of the church. It's not the hour for you to be depressed or for you to build a bunker underneath your house. No, this is the hour to rise up strong in the power of the Holy Ghost. So when you know the signs of the end times, it guarantees you won't be deceived. And it guarantees that you don't let your fire go out. Say this with me. I won't, I won't. Let, my let my fire go out. In these last days, you cannot let your fire go out. You can't get busy playing church. You have to keep the same fire that came on the inside of you. When you got born again and baptized in the Holy Ghost, you got to keep that same fire that picked you up out of the pit and put your feet on a rock to stay. Hallelujah. I See, preaching like this, I'll just mention, like, there's this... It almost becomes work-based because it's at this point, it's like if you're not on fire, if you're not as excited as you were the day you were saved, you're, you're, are you even saved anymore? Where's your excitement? The reality is, again, if you understand the walk of sanctification, it is this is becoming more and more like Jesus daily by the hope, by the help of the Holy Spirit. So not every day is going to be an on fire day. The idea is that you are persevering that you're holding fast in Jesus and that your life and your words reflect back on him and glorify him. And a lot of times, and I've said this before, a lot of times that simply means getting up, loving your family and your spouse, going to work, being faithful, doing a good job regardless of how your boss is, coming home and taking care of things. And that is far more faithful to the gospel than going and trying to summon up some energy to make it appear as if you are as on fire as the day you were saved. It is going to be this progression of sanctification in your life. Yes, there are going to be days that are better than others, that God opens a thousand different doors and you can proclaim who Jesus is and what he's done. And there's going to be days where you just have to be faithful. And it's just it, this be on fire as you were the day you were saved thing is very works-based said you got to keep the same fire that God put inside of you when you got born again and he delivered you out of sin. Can you say amen? amen. Somebody say, I'll keep, the fire. I'll keep the fire. You can't let the fire go out. God told the, the Levitical priest, he said, never let the fire on the altar go out. When you're a born again, spirit filled Christian, your life is no longer yours. Your life is on the altar. Your life's been put up here. The Bible says your life has been hid in God, in Christ. So when you're in Christ, your life is laid down up here. And your life becomes a living sacrifice. Someone once said the problem with a living sacrifice is it's always trying to crawl off the altar. <laughs> Don't let your life crawl off the altar. Jesus is coming back so soon. He's coming back so soon, and he's not coming back for some beat up, broke, busted, and disgusted bride. No, he's coming back for a spotless, without wrinkle or blemish, beautiful bride who's full of faith and the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? amen. So say this, I will be, I will be anointed, anointed 
With fresh oil. Yeah. Next, one chapter over. Matthew 25. What do you see? The parable of the ten virgins. Here's the thing. All ten of them were virgins. What's a virgin? Unspotted by the world. They're not used. They didn't sleep with the world. So although there were ten virgins, it says only five of them kept their, their uh, lamps trimmed with oil. So what happened? When the bridegroom came, five of them rose up ready. Their lamp was ready, trimmed, filled with oil. They were full of the anointing, full of the Holy Ghost. They had intimacy with God. They were prepared. They, were, they had planned ahead. They had persevered well. We're not going to get into the whole thing. But this is also where cultural um, things come into play with the ten virgins and waiting for the bride's groom. Um, there's a whole thing there. But the point is, again, Jesus is saying in this particular text that he's looking at in 24, is that you like the overarching thing is, yes, people will come. You need to, pres um, you, you need to be faithful. Right? I, I've forgotten the P word here. Preserve? No. Persevere. You need to persevere. Be faithful and persevere, even despite all of the things that you see, wars, rumors of wars, false messiahs, famine, being brought before the courts, all of the things, persevere well, because God is going to win in the end. The other five said, give us some of your oil. They said, no, I can't. You got to go pay the price for your own. I can't give you any of my oil. So what happens is many Christians, even though sometimes they'll keep their lives separate from the world, they don't keep their oil filled up. They don't spend time in prayer. They don't spend time in church. They don't spend time with God. But I believe I'm in a church this morning that's not part of those five. You're part of the other five. You're, for, you're part of the people that have full oil lamps. Can you say amen? I could see even now in the spirit. When I was in the green room over there, I could hear people praying. Ra -ba 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 -se -ke -de -ya -da -ba -ha. I could feel, I could feel your lamps were full of oil. That this isn't some lukewarm church, but this is going to be a church that God's going to use in this last day and in this hour to shake this state, to shake this nation, and to bring the fire of God to this generation. Come on, if you believe that with me, clap your hands one more time. And give Jesus the loudest shout of praise. Amen. So don't get lukewarm. Can you say amen? amen? Don't get lukewarm. Don't let the devil come and steal your fire. You have authority. You know what? Let's just get into it. Go, go with me to Luke 10. Okay, so now he's going to go to Luke 10. Um, let's see here. I know we're 30 minutes into this. I don't know. What's scary is I have no idea how long this goes. So we're going to be in Luke 10. Um, this is Jesus sending out the 72. So let's see what he does with this. Because so far, so far his whole point has been the end times are coming. You need to know what the signs are so that you aren't deceived and you don't become a lukewarm church or a lukewarm people. That so far has been his whole deal. So let's see where he's going here with Luke chapter 10. Because we were in Matthew 24. Now we're going to Luke 10. Go to Luke chapter 10. Hallelujah. Verse 19. He said this. Behold, I give you the authority. Someone say authority. I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing by any means shall harm you. God did not give you some authority when you got yoked up with Christ. It says he gave you all authority over all the power of the devil. What okay. <laughs> Let's, okay, we're not going to read the whole thing, but if you go to chapter 10, verse 1. It says, after this, again, previous things that are happening in, in chapter 10, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly that the Lord of the harvest uh, to send out uh, laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs before the midst of wolves. So this whole idea is like, hey, 
you're going out here defenseless. There's a lot of people that want to harm you. Now, there's a lot of things that happen, okay, up to this. Uh, they go out, they do these things. Now, verse 17, which is two verses before 19, the 72 returned with joy. So they've went out. He's told them to go out. They've went out. The 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Now, again, this is where we have to understand the type of text, the thing Jesus is saying. All of this is important. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that in, that your names are written in the book of life. So there's there's a couple things that Talon only reads 19. He reads, uh, let me see here. He reads 19. Behold, I have given you the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy and nothing shall harm you. That's all he reads. Okay. And that's important because he's now going to use that probably to read something that's not actually being said by Jesus. So the 72 are amazed that they're able to do anything in Jesus's name. He tells them that he saw Satan fall from heaven and that he's, he gave them the authority to be able to do all the things they did. However, that's not the important part for Jesus, right? Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. So all these amazing things that you were able to do, don't rejoice in that. What should they rejoice in, right? That their names are written in heaven. The whole idea here is that like, yes, all of these amazing things you saw, that isn't even what should excite you. What should excite you is that your names are, your names are written in heaven. Now, also, this is clearly not, this is clearly in the moment, right? Because he says, and nothing shall hurt, uh, hurt you. The disciples later go out and all of them <laughs> are hurt severely. And so we have to understand within the context, within the conversation, what is happening, what has just previously happened as he sent them out, that there is something occurring in this moment for the glory of the kingdom of God and the proclamation of Jesus' name that was in this moment. The disciples go out later, right? And they are martyred, all of them. And that's, that's what we call harm. And so it's one of those things here that we have to understand. I mean, we're not going to go through. We don't have time to go through and exegete this entire passage. This is also the danger of jumping around. But let's see what he does with 19. Because my guess is he's going to rip it out of context to say something that it doesn't say. What that means is you should write devil on your shoe underneath so that every day when you wake up and you put your shoes on the devil looks up at the bottom of your feet because he's not eye to eye with you he's not over your head he's under your feet hallelujah i said he's under your feet when you wake up in the morning you have to know the devil is not someone that i have to spend time worried about no he's small he's small and, 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 and like american lingo i like to say he's a sissy girl that's what he is he's he's a toothless cat the bible says we wrestle against powers and principalities. But it also says we've been raised up. Someone say, I've been raised up. I've been raised up. It says we've been raised up together with Christ, seated in where? Heavenly. In heavenly places. Far above. Someone say far above. Far above. Not a little bit above. Not, not mostly above. No, you've been raised up together with Christ, seated far above in heavenly places. Over every principality every power every devil every dominion every name that is named not only in this age but in the age to come when the church knows who they are in christ they are unstoppable hallelujah you get full of faith in the holy ghost and i like how my pastor says it he says it'll make you want to swing out over hell on a corn stalk and spit in the devil's eye everyone go nice so that's what happens. When you know who you are in Christ, the Bible calls it a spirit of faith. He, uh, a pastor mentioned uh, Dad Hagen, Dad Kenneth E. Hagen, mighty. So Hagen too. So yeah, we can pretty much go with he is in the uh, charismatic um, Hagen, John, John uh, is that his name? John Hagen? John Hagee? No, Hagee is different than Hagee. The point is, uh, it all fits within the charismatic movement. So we kind of give an idea of theologically where he falls. He man of God, and he preached and taught on faith. 
the spirit of faith. When you know who you are in Christ, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.13, we having the same spirit of faith. When that spirit of faith gets in you, it'll make you want to swing out over hell on a cornstalk and spit in the devil's eye. You'll disrespect the devil just like Elijah did. What happened when the, other, when the prophets of Baal were testing the man of God? He said, where is your God? If I be a man of God, where's your God? Must be using a bathroom break. That's what he said. He mocked the devil. Jesus, it says, he, he put the devil to shame openly. Publicly put him to shame. You we, are, we are blending together. We've just thrown a bunch of verses in a blender, and we are just going to town on it. Your life, I prophesy in the name of Jesus Christ, will put the devil to shame all the days of your life in Jesus' name. If you receive it, shout, I receive it. So you have to know God's word. You know what? I'll say this, too. Because you guys, you have the fire. You got the fire in this church. Here's the thing, though. It's not enough just to be a prayer warrior. You must know your Bible. You got to read the Word. Somebody say the Word. The word. You've got to be strong in the Word. I've met I've, uh, uh, Bishop uh, David Oyedepo, mighty man of God. I'm sure everybody knows. Mighty man of God. I read in his book, I believe it's Exploits of Faith. He said, I've known many a prayer warrior that was a total failure, but I've never met somebody that was full of faith and knew the word that ended up as a failure. So although you can be a prayer warrior, you must have the word of God deep in your belly. The Bible says it's faith food. When God's word gets in you, it builds up your inner man. You become strong. You start swinging out over hell on a cornstalk and you spit in the devil's eye. Okay, if he says swinging over um, hell in a cornstalk again. Can we, can we just preach the Bible at this point, Taylor, please? Someone once said it'll make a tadpole slap a whale. Envision that. A tadpole slaps a whale. Make you want to charge hell with squirt guns. It's a spirit of faith. Someone say faith. faith. Say, I have faith. I have faith. So when you get full of God's word and you know your identification in Christ, you become invincible. You become unstoppable. You start swinging out over hell every single day and spitting in the devil's eye. Every plan that's formed against your family begins to fall to pieces. Every plan formed against your business begins to fall to pieces. Every sickness begins to leave your body. Hallelujah. Every spirit of heaviness begins to drop off and you put on a garment of praise and you start saying hallelujah. I praise the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Someone shout hallelujah. hallelujah. What this leaves you with, though, again, this doesn't have anything with Luke chapter 10. But what this leaves you with is that if your business isn't doing well, if your sickness doesn't leave, if everything formed against your family doesn't get better, then the issue is your faith, right? Because he said that when you have that faith, when you have enough faith to swing out over hell in a cornstalk and spit in the devil's eye, then you got faith. If you charge hell with two squirt guns, you got faith. And so there's this idea that faith, um, the fruits of faith are demonstrated by you not having sickness or your business succeeding or whatever other good thing. And so, yeah, there are going to be times where your business succeeds because God wants you to do well. And then there are other times where your business will be terrible because you just made bad decisions regardless of how faithful you are. Um <laughs> It's just, it's crazy that, it, yeah, it's just crazy. That's the sound of faith. That's faith getting in your inner man. Hallelujah. If the devil had his way, he would get you to just sit in church and not give a rip. It, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, it's time to pray. No, someone say no. Say that won't be me. Say, I'll keep the fire. Keep, the fire. keep that fire. The same fire that Reinhard Bronke, Bonke brought to Africa. The same fire that uh, Pastor Enoch Edoboye carries. The same fire that Bishop David Oyedepo carries. The same fire that John G. Lake had in Africa. Keep that fire. Keep it burning. Keep it stoked. Paul said, stir up the gift of God within you, Timothy. Hallelujah. By the word of prophecy and the laying on of hands. Every day. Every day you got to stir it up. Someone say stir it up. 
Now stir it up. Go rabba se kede adaba ha ha ha. Come on, you gotta stir it up. Rebi adaba se kede. Hey, glory to God. So you gotta stay stirred up. Jesus is coming. He's coming so soon. He said, "Will I find faith in the earth? Will he find faith in the earth?" There's a lot of churches. He's gonna show. People are gonna be shocked because he's gonna get there, and there's gonna be no faith in that church. Not in this church, in Jesus' name. But So here's the thing, I guess, because this is just kind of, what do the kids say? Mid. <laughs> this is very mid preaching. Um, because it's a, it's a, first of all, we're not even really, we're not going through the scriptures. We haven't covered context. We're not uh, bringing out the surrounding passages. We're not talking about the fact that Israel had been waiting for Messiah for a long time. Uh, we're not talking about the the prophecy that Jesus gives about, you know, the coming persecution of those that follow him and then the exact thing happening. Um, we don't, we're not following any of that. Um, and I get, maybe, maybe you don't do that, right? Maybe that's not everybody's cup of tea, but what you can do, at least from these passages, is talk about the overarching principle of perseverance. Like the reality is things are going to happen. Bad things are going to come. Birth pains will occur. Okay, great they're coming, then how do we then train people, disciple people, uh, help people use discernment to, you know, view the world, world around them and persevere well for Jesus? Just telling them, stir up faith, isn't exactly helpful. It's a matter of saying, get in your word. Now, he did say that, to be fair. He said, be in the Bible. But we have to train people on how to read the word well. Again, hermeneutics, exegesis, prescriptive, descriptive. Like, these things are important. Paul tells Timothy that it's for correction. The word of God is for correction, right? For calling out, for encouragement, for building up, so that the man of God right? will be righteous. So these things are what what the Bible is for, what the scriptures are for. And so if we're not doing those things and we're just saying, Jesus is coming back soon, stir up the fire in you. What does that mean practically? I mean, so far, all that's meant practically, as far as Talon's talked about, is speaking in tongues, uh, not losing the fire you had when you were first born, and not becoming a lukewarm American church. Those are the three things that he's basically talked about. We haven't got any practical ways to do that, it's just that Jesus is coming back soon. Don't be those things or do, or you should do those things, depending on which one you're talking about. It's just not, it's, it, it lays all the onus on you without giving you any practical steps of what you should be doing. And it doesn't even begin like the Luke 10 verse that he pulled out Luke verse uh, 10 chapter 10, verse 19. It's completely just thrown in there um, because of his theological bent charismatically. You don't even need to include Luke 10, 19. It's totally ripped out of context. Now, if we're going to Matthew 24, there's a whole lot that we could actually dig in there. And I think we've already done that on on, on our end of things. Um, I don't know how much longer this is going to be, honestly. We're at... Uh, <laughs> we're 26 minutes into the sermon. But there's going to be churches that, that Jesus comes to, and it says he'll come like lightning. Pew. It won't be... The, the second time when he comes to, and we come back for the New Jerusalem, that's when it'll be... Ah! all the angels and everything, brr, brr, the trumpets, and, and that'll be all glory. But he said, when I come to rapture the church, it'll be like lightning. Poof. He said, two will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. He said, two will be in bed. One will be taken and one will be left. Who's going to be left? It's going to be the people, the other five virgins, that although they lived right, they let their fire go out. But if you make sure to get, never let your fire go out, you will never be left. You'll be going out of here on the first trip in Jesus' mighty name. Can you say amen? amen. So you've got to stay full of faith in these last days. You've got to live a holy and consecrated life. Don't let the American Western way of doing things ever taint you. Stay holy. Keep your life on the altar. Now, holiness doesn't get you into heaven. Or the Bible says you're saved by grace through what? Through faith. So you having faith in the blood of Jesus, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that's what gets you saved by grace. But Okay, we need to remember that. It was at 1 hour 27 minutes that he did talk about this. So that's, it's there. Living holy make sure that you get out of here on the first trip in the rapture. There's going to be a lot of people that they get stuck in the... Also interesting, again, so 
he says, don't become like the American church and then mentions Darby's rapture theology, which is a hundred percent from the American church. So like, there's just some inconsistencies here. This is again, why I'm, I don't expect everyone to be some sort of church historian. I'm not, I'm a very amateur ch- church historian. Like I'm not like, I, I, I'm reading through books that I think are incredibly helpful that have been recommended and they have been incredibly helpful, but I'm not saying I know all of the things. But when Taylor says, don't become like a lukewarm American church and then mentions a rapture, that's a hundred percent within the last few hundred years of American theology in regards to end times. So he's, he doesn't, I'm not even sure he's aware of how much he has been influenced by the American church. The tribulation because they didn't live right, but you have to live holy. You have to be a vessel of honor. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that there's different kinds of vessels in this world that the Lord uses. Vessels of gold and silver, of honor, honorable vessels. And then he says dishonorable vessels. These are vessels of wood and of clay. These are vessels that said, all right, yeah, like, I love the Lord and stuff, but I don't even, I still got a side woman on my side. I still got, I'm still fooling around on my wife, or I'm still looking at that stuff on my phone. This is, these kind of people will be left behind. And I didn't even plan on preaching on this this morning, but I praise the Lord. I'm going down this route because the church needs to hear it. I said the church needs to hear it. People need to hear that you've got to live right because day is now, but night surely cometh when no man can work. There's coming an hour where you won't be able to get it right anymore. But right now is the day of salvation. By the power of the Holy Ghost, you can kick that junk right out of your life and never turn back. Can you say amen? Amen. So somebody say this. I I will get rid rid of sin. sin. Say sin Sin. is under my feet. So the Lord gave you dominion. He's given you authority over all the power of the devil. Is sin the power of God or the power of the devil? The devil. So sin is not something that you have to struggle with your whole life. The blood of Jesus paid the price for it. It's already been washed away. It's been wiped. You've been made white as snow. You just got to take it off and put it under your feet by the Holy Ghost. So sin no longer has dominion over you. That's what it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Let's say that together. Sin no longer has dominion over me. The power of sin has been broken off of your life once and for all. You never have to go back. You don't have to go back and watch that stuff. You don't have to go back and listen to that stuff. You don't have to go back and see that boy, see that girl. You can live holy. You can live right. You can stay full of faith and the fire of the Holy Ghost in these last days and in these last hours. You don't have to live like everybody else. The Bible says you are in this world, but you are not of this world. You're different. Someone say, I'm different. See, you look like everybody else, but you're not like everybody else. You're not. You can, that's why I love the African church. I love that God is bringing it back to America because they lost it. They lost this fire. They lost this faith. They lost this prayer. But I believe this is one of the churches that God is raising up in these last days and in these last hours to carry this fire back into this state. In Jesus' mighty name. Everybody say amen. So you've got to carry it. The fire is on your pastor to carry it to this generation, to carry it to this nation, to carry it to this region. Virginia shall be saved. I said Virginia shall be saved by the mighty hand of God. Hallelujah. He's on a mission. God's anointed him. Someone say, I'm anointed. See, you've been... Okay, this is where... I just want to say this. This is where... He's mentioned some of the things that you would want to hear in a sermon, right? As far as Jesus' life, death, resurrection, salvation is through faith alone. Like all of these things are really important to mention when you're preaching through the scriptures. The issue is though, he's not really preaching through the scriptures. It's that he's, he's interjected a bunch of verses that don't necessarily even connect we haven't went in to explain them. They're, they're to prop up his point, right? So there's there's two ways to preach. I would argue one of them 
much better than others. Whereas you are preaching through the word and the word holds itself up by very nature of it being scripture, right? So um, this is this is expositional preaching, right? This is going through verse by verse, preaching through it, talking about context, talking about culture, talking about what the original audience uh, would have heard, why they were hearing it, what was being said, why it was being said. These are all... The, I, I see very little reason to not preach expositionally unless you are addressing specifically a topic that requires you to go through and demonstrate where that theology is seen through different texts. That would be a topical sermon. The danger of topical preaching, as Talon seems to be doing right here as far as the last days and staying on fire, is that you are going to jump from text to text, and the text then props up your point, not you just preaching the text and it holding its own weight. And so now you'll you'll go away and say, man, Talon really like encouraged us to stay on fire. Well, yeah, but there's there's plenty of scriptures in which if you were to walk through that scripture, the depth of that scripture would actually encourage you more because the onus is on scripture then to demonstrate God's power in saving you, to persevere you, to hold you up, right? Uh, versus having to, you know, be explained that via topical way by Talon, for example. Um, so we've heard a whole lot of, you know, I mean, not all of this is terrible, but again, as I've said before, we have to be able to distinguish between just what sounds good versus what, versus what is really good. Um, just because he's mentioned, you know, Jesus' death and resurrection being the cornerstone of salvation, that's great, good. That's like, duh, though. I mean, we should be looking for that. And I'll give him props for even mentioning it because there are sermons that nobody mentions it in at all. Uh, but as I've talked about before, the three things we look for as far as reading the scripture, exegeting the scripture, and preaching the gospel, that's a low bar. We should... We should really want a lot more than that. So let's get back in. I don't know how much longer this is, to be frank with you. You've been anointed with the Holy... I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Hallelujah. You've been anointed with the Holy Ghost and power to go around doing good and healing all that are oppressed of the devil. God has an assignment for your life. God's not done with you. Doesn't matter how old you may be or feel. Doesn't matter how young you are. Doesn't matter if you don't feel seen by God. He has a plan for you. He has a destiny for you. He has an anointing for you. He has an assignment for you. He has a mission for you in this nation and in this final hour. Hallelujah. Someone say, I have an assignment. You must find the assignment that God has for your life. God has given you an assignment in this area, in this church, in this nation, in this region. There's something so special that God wants to do in your life and wants to put inside of you by the Holy Ghost. I believe you're going to walk out of this week with that exact assignment in Jesus' mighty name. Can you say amen? amen. All right, so here's three areas that you've received authority over. Number one, over sickness and disease. Jesus gave you authority over sickness and disease. I'm going to preach on that tonight. And we're going to have miracle signs and wonders. Yeah. You know, there was a, a, about a year and a half ago, there was a woman that came. She came onto my broadcast. It was when we were just growing on YouTube. Okay, so here's the thing. I mean, obviously, we've already established that he's charismatic. That's not a big uh, thing. We've now sort of established that he is in the Benny Hinn S sort of movement of God has given you authority over diseases. Now, he's probably the only place he's even going to start to get that sort of twisting of scripture from is 19, Luke chapter 10, 19, which is probably why he mentioned it uh, with the whole, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy and nothing shall harm you. My guess is is that is where he's going to get that. Again, I would just like to point out that the following verse is what Jesus says is the main point. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Oh, how we often miss that. So he's going to go through two more points, which just tells me that we are just midway through the sermon here. Thanks for sticking with us this far. If you've found this to be helpful, make sure you leave a like and <laughs> subscribe. And now he's going to get into apparently his growth on YouTube. There's a lot of like YouTube 
people that got popular on YouTube and then because they're popular on YouTube, people have them come speak at places. It's a bad idea, just so you know. Very bad idea. Um, for various reasons. Um, but anyway, here we go. So Talon's going to get into that. Apparently, the one thing that you have been given authority over is sickness. So theoretically, given what Talon says here is that you should not have um, common colds, cancer, ailments of any kind. Um, he just uses no verse to back that up, but let's see what his uh, story is and then point two. We're at just over 3 million YouTube subscribers now by the grace of God, but at that time we only had 7,000. So we were like, itty bitty, everybody say itty bitty. I do that for my own entertainment. Itty bitty. It's funny to me. But we, we had like 7,000 subscribers. We, we didn't have, I mean, I didn't feel like anybody was watching. But there was a woman. This was, I had my team up in Iowa at the time. There was a woman in Minnesota who she was watching our ministry on YouTube. And she saw that I was preaching on the fact that Jesus gave you dominion over sickness and disease. Because it says in Romans chapter 8 verse 2, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has given me victory or dominion or authority over the power of sin and death. The law of sin and death. So that law of life that's in Christ makes me victorious over every sickness and every disease. Holy cow. <laughs> Well, that went, I didn't think he was going to use another verse, but there it is. So I would just encourage you to go to Romans chapter eight real quick. Obviously there's a lot of, there's a lot of things we could study here. We're jumping in blind, no clue what's going on. But I think as always, again, don't have to be a super deep biblical scholar to point out that some things are wrong. So let's start at verse one of chapter eight. There is therefore no, now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Okay. For the law of the spirit is life has set you free in Jesus Christ from the law of sin and death. So he's juxtapositioning the law of spirit. I'm sorry. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Jesus Christ from the law of sin and death. So there's two laws and the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So again, previous thing, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. There is death outside of Christ. There is life inside of Christ. If you, this is Paul talks about this in, um, I can't remember if it's first or second Corinthians, a uh, second Corinthians. He talks about that. We are ministers of uh, reconciliation, right? The reason reconciliation needs to occur is because when you are apart from Christ, outside of Christ, a rebellious individual toward God, your creator, there has to be reconciliation made. And so he's talking about a very similar thing here. There's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Why? Because you're in Jesus Christ. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free from, uh, set you free in Jesus Christ from the law of sin and death. This is why the resurrection is important. Sin brings forth death. Jesus rose from the dead. He defeats sin and death. This is the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, is that sin and death are no longer to be feared because Jesus has defeated them. You can be free in him. There is no condemnation. Verse 1 of chapter 8 here. Verse 3, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law may be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, right? There's more we could go on. The point is he's unpacking the gospel for them. There is nothing here. Hear me. Nothing here about the fact that you have power over sickness. This is a hundred percent reading in, ironically, an American reading in, of things that are not in the scripture here. He's actually taking the glorious news of the gospel and making it something much smaller. And he's making the resurrection of Jesus, his defeat of sin and death, into something very inconsequential, right? Paul talks about this too. These momentary, momentary inflictions are actually building something within us for the glory of God. Um, that's also in uh, 2 Corinthians, it's uh, into chapter 4. And so the idea here is that th there's nothing in Romans 8, but we're not going there, right? He's just mentioning it. And because he's just mentioning it and we're not actually walking through it, 
we're just going to believe that, yeah, oh, this is about sickness. Or, or we have power over sickness. Can you say amen? So she saw me preaching that on my live stream. She had a 15-year-old boy who had cancer, and he was in the hospital. And the doctor said, there's nothing we can do. I think it was stage two at that point. They said it's going to continue to metastasize. It'll go to stage three. It'll go to stage four, and he's going to die. He's not going to last very long. They were trying to find natural therapies for him, chemo and all that stuff. She didn't want to do it. And all of a sudden, she said, my live stream came up on her desktop. And she started listening about how Jesus is a healer. How he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That he's not some dead religion like Buddha or some other dead idol. He's alive and he lives forevermore. So she started hearing me preach on this. And, I, and she, she typed in the comments. She said, I'm coming down. I'm going to get my son out of the hospital. And I'm going to bring him four hours to come and see you so you can pray for him. And she did. That next weekend, she brought him down. And uh, she comes up. We didn't even have the service yet. Somebody say faith. faith. Think about Mark chapter 5. There's a woman with an issue of blood. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. And it said that she heard Jesus was coming to her town. She heard that this man, he... I really hope he is not going to, in a really weird, inverted way, make himself the Jesus-esque character here where the woman of blood obviously fights to the crowd because she knows there's something special about Jesus, doesn't even want to talk to him, just knows if she touches the hem of his garment, she will be made well because she's there's nothing else she knows to try other than this prophet that she's heard of. Hopefully, Taylor isn't like, hey, this mom, she brought her son to me. I prayed for him. He got healed. Praise Jesus. Now, let me just say, Jesus, yes, I know people in my church that have miracles for the glory of God. And then I know people that died not being healed from those exact same things. God will do what God will do. And he's got reasons for it, for his glory. And so sometimes there are light momentary afflictions that we have to go through for the glory of God. And we're not going to get healed for them, from them because they are for the glory of God. And then there are other people, for whatever reason, God does heal. And we praise him in both cases. He heals the leper. He raises the dead. He cleanses all the lepers and casts out devils. She heard that he was healing every kind of sickness and disease. And she said, I know if I but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And what happened when she heard? How does faith come? By hearing and hearing the word of God. She heard the reports of Jesus. And she didn't say, well, like the American church, if it be God's will, brother, maybe... Jesus will heal me. Okay, so now there's just a, it's a mockery at this point. So the assumption is if you come forward in faith, you're going to get healed. That is evidentially wrong. Um, but the idea is that there's this sort of like straw man argument made between different theological positions that if it's God's will, he'll heal. Yeah. Now, we have faith that God can and he will if it's within his plan. The idea is that it may not be immediate. There are people that I know have prayed for six, seven, eight years for God to heal them, and they do eventually get healed. But it doesn't mean their faith was any less faithful at the beginning of that prayer than it was the moment they got healed. And the stories that come out about perseverance of faith in that those times are absolutely amazing. And so, like, I know I sometimes straw in other theological positions. I've tried to do that less now just because I've seen examples of what like Taylor just did as far as just straw manning the argument of like, well, if, we, if it's God's will, brother, the reality is that it, it is all in God's hands if he's going to do it or not. It's just that's you see that in scripture that's evident in church history. That's evident in, in the lives of believers every day today that, you know, let's get back to it because he's still not to his second point. We got two more to go. And the devil's on the other side going, maybe. <laughs> no, that's not what she said. She said, I know. Somebody say, I know. I See, she didn't guess. She didn't doubt. She didn't waver in unbelief. She said, I know. If I but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And just like, just like that woman with the issue of blood. And she, when she touched him, Jesus said, who touched me? And what happened was the disciples looked at him astonished. They said, Master. There's hundreds of people touching you. What do you mean who touched me? Every, everybody's touching you. He said, no, 
Somebody touched me. I felt virtue come out of me. He said, I felt power come out of me. What was the difference? There's a difference in the touch of curiosity and the touch of faith. Many people come into the house of God real curious. Oh, the evangelist is in town. I wonder what he's going to do. Maybe he's going to shout. Maybe he'll stand up on a chair and run around the building. But then there's other people that say, no, I believe God. I'm coming in faith. I'm coming to get my miracle. I'm coming to get some impartation. I'm coming for God to do a mighty work in my life and in my family. Hallelujah. So there's a touch of curiosity, and then there's a touch of faith. Somebody say faith. faith. The touch of faith is different. The touch of faith is different. That's what I love, I love about African culture is faith. America's full of so much unbelief. You can see, like, I just feel like he's... <laughs> I wish I would have taken account on how many times he says African culture just to appeal to his audience. The thing is, like, it doesn't matter what church you're in. African, American, Korean. The fact is, if you are a believer, this is like the whole glorious news of the gospel is regardless of cultural context, if you follow Jesus, if you've been transformed by the gospel, we are now brothers and sisters. Now, are there different cultural uh, expressions within different churches? Yes. And those do represent the cultures you come from as far as type of worship, um, what that sort of fleshes itself out to look like as far as dancing or singing or hands up or hands down or hymns or certain songs. Uh, obviously, language plays into that. But like the idea is that we're all brothers and sisters. So it, it, it just seems like a sort of a virtue signaling in, a, in part to keep saying that. And I'm thankful because God's using people like you to push it out of here. Hey, I said he's using people like you to push it out of here, to get faith back in America. Can you say amen? amen. So this woman, she heard on my live stream that, that we were praying for the sick and we were having miracles. So she drives four and a half hours. She went and pulled her, her son out of the hospital. He was already having treatments. She pulls him out of the hospital, brings him down. I didn't even preach that day. She was just so full of faith. She brought him right up to me. She said, this is my son, Wyatt. He has stage two cancer. I need you to pray for him so he'll be healed. We didn't have a service, didn't have worship. I didn't do the tango. I did nothing. We had nothing. It was like the service hadn't even started yet. She just had faith. And she brought him down. I laid my hands on him. I said, you foul cancer, come out in Jesus' name. And he didn't, he didn't, this is what he did. Thanks. That's, that's all he did. He didn't even, it wasn't even his faith. It was his mother's faith. I prophesy your faith is going to shake other people's lives in Jesus' mighty name. Can you say amen? amen? So it wasn't even his faith. It was mama's faith. And she said, thank you. Thank you so much. Two days later, she goes to the doctors, And she said, the doctors just got back to us. We brought them in for an examination. And uh, they've been running tests on them all day. And they're starting to get mad at me. And we're like, what? Why are they starting to get mad at you? They said, because when we came last time, they said that he had stu stage two cancer. But now they can't find any trace of cancer in his entire body. Because Jesus Christ is a healer. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And he still heals today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Hallelujah. Come on, if you believe that with me, give a mighty shout unto God. That's amazing. And I think if that's a true story, that's absolutely amazing. Again, I think if you go to a local church, you very likely have stories like that of people that had cancer that don't anymore, that were on death's doorstep, that are now alive and are testifying to the goodness of God. Like those are things that God still does. The issue I have is his use of the verse in which it's like everybody can get free of cancer. That's just not how God seems to work in the scriptures or in Christians' lives now or 2,000 years ago. He will heal and he can heal and he does heal. But it's not dependent on your faith. He's already, well, he kind of already said that without saying it about the mom's face. But the reality is that he's going to do what he's going to do. Now, I don't know how this fits in. <laughs> to Matthew chapter 24, because that's on the last days. This seems to, we've seemed to go from be prepared for the last days, don't be duped by false, uh, false Christ, stay on fire, stoke that fire, and know that you have 
power to tread on the enemy in the last days. Like, this is just very, like, kind all over the place. He's alive! Hallelujah! Somebody shout victory! victory. See, he's given you victory yes. over every sickness and every disease. Amen. Doesn't matter if anyone else believes it. If you believe it, someone say, I believe it. I believe Doesn't matter if that, if that kid had faith. Mama had faith. Hallelujah. So what that means is if you have kids that aren't serving the Lord, they're coming home in Jesus' mighty name. Okay, hold on. That has nothing to do with sickness, though. Okay. That has nothing to do with sickness. I'm not sure how he's tying this in. So we've went from you have power over sickness to God's going to save your kids. So number one, sickness and disease. Number two, the power of sin. Jesus has given you victory and dominion over all the power of sin. Sin no longer has to have dominion in your life. If you'll get filled with the Holy Ghost and power, it'll fall off. It said, it said when the fire of God came on Samson, when he was bound with ropes, the, the ropes burnt off. When the fire of God comes on you, every bondage just breaks off. The fire of the Holy Ghost burns off every spirit of heaviness, every addiction, every lust of the eyes, every lust of the flesh, every pride of life. It just burns it off. See, now there is a difference, right? The old man is dead. The new man has come. This is how Paul words it, right? Um, this is also why you have to exegete scripture. And I know it's a big word I use all the time. This is just why you have to study scripture. The reality is that temptations will still come and there's still things that people wage over. Now, is that to say that if you're trapped in a habitual sin that like you just deal with it? No, I mean, if you're trapped in the sin of alcoholism and you're a believer, there's a reason you have a local church to walk with you through that, to be in prayer with you, to assist you, to be that stopgap so they can stay, you know, so when you are tempted to go back, you don't because you have somebody there helping you. Same thing with the addiction to uh, any sort of drug. Uh, the same thing to the addiction of maybe um, lust or pornography. Same thing with the addiction of um, greed, gossip, all of these things that Paul says that such were some of you, right? Um, the idea being is that the temptation is still there. The draw is still there. It is discipleship, sanctification by the Holy Spirit, that then you walk a faith. Again, this all still does tie into walking a faithful life in perseverance. It's just that like this, what he's preaching, there's been a lot of things that he's touched on that are close to right. But then, so you're saved by faith through grace, but then he puts a lot of weight on that. Like you have to serve your own faith. You have to always be faithful. If you're not faithful, you won't be healed. And then this right here is like, well, there's no sin. And if you have any struggles at all, then you're not really saved because when you are saved, you don't struggle with sin anymore. And so it's just, there's a lot of things here. I'm sorry, if you can hear my chair, I got to get a new one. Um, if you, a lot of things he's saying here are half truths that then make people question if they're really saved or if they have the power of God. That's what the fire of God does. That's what's going to hit this place this week. Hallelujah. The fire of God. Somebody shout fire. I feel it even now. Praise the Lord. So sickness and disease. Number two, sin. Number three, poverty. Jesus gave you authority over poverty. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I'm just going to wait till the verse. What's the verse? It says in Galatians 3.13... That Christ has redeemed us. Somebody say, I'm redeemed. It doesn't say he's going to redeem you. You have been redeemed from all the curse of the law. Poverty is a part of that curse. Poverty is under your feet. Doesn't matter if every person in your family was poor up to you. Doesn't matter if it ran in your family. It ran in your family till it ran into you. Po okay. All right. Galatians, guys. Chapter 3. Um, he uses 13. Uh, of course, we are going to go back to verse 10. At least that's gets us in the idea of range here. For all who rely on works of the law are under the curse. 
So those that rely on the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So the law is referring to the book of the law. And so the idea is if you don't do everything written in the book of the law, and that's the book of Moses, then you are a curse. That's what they're referring to, for it is written. Now, verse 11. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Verse 13, this is the one he references. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. So what is the curse of the law? He's already said the curse of the law is, uh, um, he references, curse be everyone who does not abide by the things written in the book of the law and do them. So back to verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming the curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Jesus Christ the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. His whole point is that they have this idea of how curses work. So this is why he references, Cursed by, is anyone who is hanged on a tree. But Christ was hanged on a tree. He was not clearly cursed by God. So that Christ, in Christ Jesus, the blessings, this is verse 14, blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles <clears throat> as well. Now, it's important to note the context of what he's talking about. The blessing of Abraham, so the blessing of the Jews, the covenant of the Jews that God made through Abraham now comes to the Gentiles, which clearly don't keep the book of the law, right? Which is why he references in verse 10, cursed be everyone who does not abide by the things written in the book of the law and do them. And so he's making this juxtaposition between Jews and Gentiles, those who are in Abraham and who's, those who are not, that's saying that Jesus takes that curse for us. This is why we have uh, verse, well, verse 13 that he reads, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming the curse for us. I mean, he's taking the gospel and making it into these, these false things that you have authority over. Authority over poverty, authority over sickness, authority over sin. And the second one seems good until you dive into what he really means by it. <sighs> Please write down and re look at references the pastors make, right? If they don't, if they, like Taylor here, when he makes a reference to Galatians, hopefully you would write that down if you're in the congregation and go home after and actually read. Again, we did very little Bible study there. There's a whole lot more you could do with the passage in Galatians. That was in very quick, but just reading the before and after and knowing a little bit about the context of Galatians, you're able to understand that what he's saying is not right. Poverty's under your feet. It's not over your head and it's no longer in your pockets. Can you say amen? amen. Say poverty, poverty is under my feet. You don't have to be broke. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 that Jesus became poor for us. He says he took our poverty, that by his poverty we might become rich. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus took your poverty on the cross. That curse doesn't have to plague you anymore. Well, we had generational curses in our family. Well, you can say what. Hey, um, real quick on the generational curse thing. We did a whole video on the Bible and Pastors podcast about generational curses. I'll try to remember to link it in the description. It is, um, th this term gets thrown around a lot, a lot, and it's nonsense. Like, you really need to look into how to actually view that. Anyway, so we're going to go, because I just want to make sure we cover these verses. I, I We had to wait until an hour and 20 minutes into this review to actually get to anything substantial that we could look at for him here. But he also mentioned 2 Corinthians chapter 8. He specifically talks about verse 9. Uh, we'll start at verse 8 to give just a tiny little bit of context. I say this not as a command, but uh, to prove by the earnestness of others that your, uh, your love has... Yeah. 
uh, the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. And then verse 9, For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through though he was rich, though he was God, yet for our sake he became poor, he became human, so that you may be his poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. And in this manner I give my judgment. This benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also desire to do it. And so now, finish doing it as well, so that your readiness in desiring to be made, uh, your desiring it may be matched with your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there... It is uh, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased uh, and you burden, that it may, as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their needs, so that their abundance may supply your need, and that you may be uh, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathers much has nothing left over, and whoever gathers little has no lack. But thank be to God, who put into the hearts of Titus the same earnestness, earnest care I have for you. Right. So what he's talking about is giving. I'm sure if we went up to uh, chapter 7, we'd see a little bit of this. Uh, the point is that they are giving to help others. And so the idea is he's reminding them of their generosity, that they should be generous because God has given much to them. Again, that's, man, I wish we had time to dig into this because I'm sure there's more there. But the point is um, that at the very least, he's talking about that God became poor for us so that we may become rich in righteousness. And the idea, I wish we had time to actually dig into it. We don't. We're already an hour and a half into this. Point is, read just read all of chapter 8, maybe into chapter 7. What you're going to see is that he's talking about them giving to help other believers, and he's using Jesus coming to be man as a way to demonstrate that God didn't hold anything back, and he has changed us, and therefore, in our changing, we are fair in giving and generosity to others, I believe. I'd have to look more into it. It definitely doesn't mean that you aren't poor anymore whatever you want. The Bible says I've been redeemed from all the curse of the law. Hallelujah. I don't care what ran in my family. I got a new bloodline. Hallelujah. I don't care what ran in my family. I got a new daddy. I got a new older brother named Jesus. I've been made a new creation in Christ. Can you say amen? So it doesn't matter what ran in your family. Doesn't matter what goes all the way back to the village. You're a new creature in Christ. All things. Also, it's very interesting that the only Bible reference we've had put up on screen the entire time is the one about not being poor. Things have become new. Hallelujah. All things have passed away. So Jesus gave you authority over sickness, over disease, over sin, over poverty. And he's coming back very soon for an on fire bride, a bride that says, I'm a 10 out of 10 on fire for God. I'm not going to be lukewarm and get spit out of his mouth. No, I'm full of faith and the Holy Ghost and I'm putting sin under my feet. I'm putting sickness under my feet. I'm putting poverty under my feet and I'm rising up in my covenant with God. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Man, this is going to be a great week. I can just tell you guys pull it out of me. You just pull it out of me. You're such a hungry church. We're going to see many signs and wonders this week. Amen. There's going to be testimonies that come out of this week like you've never seen before in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Come on, if you believe it, shout, I believe it. Shout, I receive it. Say, I've got the fire of the Holy Ghost. So I feel to, to talk about the money side of things for a second. Many people in America won't, and, and I love America, I, I love this nation, that's like, I, I genuinely love my nation, but there are people that I wish were not in my nation, so, <laughs> and it's lukewarm Christians, lukewarm churches, and they won't teach you about God's blessing in your life, you have to know it, because how are you going to fund the end time gospel? How are you going to fund the end time harvest if you don't know what the Bible says about your finances? I, I don't know a lot about this guy, but I do know enough that he wants you to sow seeds into his ministry for the end times gospel. This seems very self-beneficial. 
You have to know that the Bible says you don't have to stay broke. I'm a living testimony of it. Your pastor, he, he said earlier, yeah, he flew down here in a private jet. I did. I flew down here in a private jet. Praise the Lord. By the blessing of God. And here's the thing. My ministry didn't pay for it. My own business paid for it. My side hustle paid for it. I prophesy there's going to be side hustles in this house that you're going to pay for private jets in Jesus' mighty name. Is that the most efficient? Like, here's the thing. I get it. Whatever. If you have enough money, you can do whatever you want with it. Do whatever you want with it. The idea, though, is that as believers, aren't we supposed to be very wise in how we spend our money? And it just seems to me that unless it was some huge time conflict in which you have to be places at certain times, it's probably cheaper just to buy a plane ticket. I don't know, though. I don't know. Hallelujah. You're going to look over and say, yeah, that wasn't even my main hustle. That was my side hustle. Hallelujah. See, that was my side hustle that paid for that jet. And I loved it. It was a great ride. But the Lord spoke to me because of everything that happened during the pandemic in 2020. When you can see how the plan of the devil is trying to shut down America, trying to shut down the world. The Antichrist agenda is trying to come in too quick, but he won't be allowed to come in. I said he won't be allowed to come in because the Bible says there's a restrainer in the earth. And the restrainer is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the devil's trying to overplay his hand. See, I'm going I'm to tell you this. There's a five-fold agenda of the Antichrist. Number one, a one-world money system. The Antichrist that says in the book of Revelation... So hold on. So Jesus is coming soon, but ooh, the Antichrist, we're not going to let him come, which doesn't feed into his dispensationalist theology within the rapture. Because the idea of the rapture is the Antichrist has to rise up for Jesus then to take his church out of the world. And so if the Antichrist isn't allowed to come, then Jesus won't take his church out of the world. And so he's not going to come back soon, even though Talon's already said he's going to come back soon. So now his theology, at least his eschatology, is fighting against itself for whatever reason is trying to put in a one world money system what are you seeing right now cashless society crypto currency bitcoin all these you cannot tell me that bro don't have crypto I guarantee you has crypto say now you're starting to see those little chips that they put in your debit card they're starting to put them in people's hands they're starting to put them in people's foreheads exactly what the bible said okay <laughs> who has a chip in their head for money. I mean, I know Elon Musk has like, he put like one chip in one person's head, which is crazy. But who's got a chip in their head that bangs it against the keypad to pay for something? Nobody has that. At least it's like not. Yeah. 20 and 30 years ago, if you said, if you started preaching like this, people would be like, yeah, I know the Bible says that, but like, how is that going to happen? But no, this is also where context and culture comes in. It's again, we, we're not going to get into it, but just read a little bit about that verse. You look at today, and it's right around the corner. You can see how there's already in Switzerland and uh, in, in other nations around the world where you can use your palm to pay for things. They put a mark in your hand and, bzz, all right, there you go. Get your groceries. All right, you can use tap to pay. Just, just, does he not use tap to pay? The Bible says in the last days, you will not be allowed to trade. You'll not be allowed to bargain. You'll not be allowed to travel without a mark in your hand or in your forehead. So you don't have a passport? You don't have a, you don't have a passport? I'm sure, you ta I'm sure he takes a private jet outside of the continental U.S. And he has a passport. He doesn't have to scan his hand, but he's got it. He's still got it. He's still tracked. We're literally seeing it come to pass right now. So a one world money system. That also, the only reason I mentioned the crypto stuff that he probably owns or the passport that I'm sure he has is because it's inconsistent in what he's saying. The, the only thing that he has an issue with is if it's in your hand or forehead versus if it's, it's, it's all things that are already happening. The only reason I say that is, is because it, he's showing inconsistency in his application of theology. Um, and his view of it seemingly as a scare tactic to get money for a ministry that's why it's important for you to know your covenant with god for it says in deuteronomy 8 18 the lord has given me power to get wealth somebody say power, power. he gives you power to get wealth 
so that you don't stay broke, so that you can stay financially free and the government doesn't decide your finances. The devil doesn't decide your finances. You're hooked up to heaven. I said, you've got a heavenly bank account. That's what decides your finances. So uh, the Lord spoke to me a couple of weeks ago and he said, I want you to start believing me to fly private everywhere you go because I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The, I, the Lord spoke to me and told me I need to fly private everywhere I go. And guys, that's why I fly private. I mean, I would be against what the Lord told me if I didn't. Round two is starting to come out with all this stuff. With everything going, how am I supposed to be an evangelist if they want me to put a face diaper on everywhere that I go? And they're like, oh, you can't. There is nobody in 2023 making you put a face diaper on. Can't come through here, brother. Do you have the jab? Do you have this and all that? You know, and hopefully my YouTube account doesn't get banned, but whatever. I don't care. I'm not afraid of that. The devil needs to know he's under my feet. And so the Lord spoke to me and he said, prepare yourself to fly privately regularly so that you don't have to get stuck in all that stuff so that I can still send you all over the world to preach the gospel. See, when you know, and, and I'll tell you. I'm sorry though, you guys are out of luck because I mean, you're not an evangelist and therefore you can't like, sorry, the Lord's not going to tell you to, pri to fly private because you don't need to get everywhere. So, you know, too bad. God didn't speak that to you. This is why it doesn't mean much unless you know where I came from. I came from poverty. I did not, I wasn't born in this suit. I wasn't, I wasn't born with this Rolex. I, I wasn't born in a private jet. I was born in poverty. I remember we had so little when I was growing up that I ate for, you guys know what tuna is? Tuna fish and the can of tuna. So I, for lunch, I ate an entire can of tuna on a sandwich instead of half a can of tuna. And my dad whooped me for it. Cause he said, boy, you can eat a half a can of tuna. You don't need a whole can of tuna. So, and how many of you ever grew up in households like that, where it was like everybody was poverty-minded? Yeah. It, it, all I heard were my family members talking about debt and talking about bills and talking about how they were always financially behind. Poverty is a curse. And I grew up in that curse. But hallelujah, that curse was pinned on that cross 2,000 years ago. And it no longer plagues my life. So I grew up like that. I... I'll just say the reason this is so frustrating is because we're literally talking about being made new, right? From sin and death to be found and reconciled in Jesus Christ. And we're making it about money right now. Do you understand that we're talking about life and death, rebellion, reconciliation, being made new creatures, and we're talking about money, I grew up in poverty. I grew up not knowing that God wants to bless my finances. But about three and a half years ago, I heard a mighty man of God uh, named Evangelist Jonathan Shuttlesworth. And he was preaching on the prosperity and the blessing of God, that God wants to prosper you. And I mean, 500 scriptures on prayer, 500 scriptures on faith, over 2,000 scriptures on finances and God blessing you financially. I bet most of those are taken out of context. So it's like kind of hard to miss that topic in the Bible. Now, for every promise that the Bible gives you about money, there's a warning. So the Bible says it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Not money. Money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's... I feel like this is an entire justification for flying private. Like we haven't given any application to these people about it the root of all evil see money in your hand is a tool it's a weapon against the kingdom of darkness money in your heart is a poison so you never let money get in your heart you just let money be in your hand so you can fund the gospel so you can send out missionaries so you can fund your pastor as he builds churches like this all over virginia can you say amen, amen. so three years ago three years ago i had negative 233 dollars in my bank account how, you guys, how many of you have ever had negative in your bank account? No shame. I know. I know. They always, they, they always said there was a place called rock bottom. And they said, you can't get any lower than rock bottom. No, you can. I've been lower than rock bottom. It's called negative dollars. You can get below zero. I had negative $233 in my bank account. And it was when I got a hold of, I got revelation knowledge on financial blessing. Every breakthrough in faith comes from a breakthrough in revelation knowledge. So the Bible says my people destroyed themselves due to a what? Lack of knowledge. What you don't know. Many people say ignorance is bliss. No, 
Ignorance is a mistake. It will cost you. Whatever you don't know belongs to you in that Bible, the devil will steal it from you. So you must know what the Bible says about your finances. I got a hold of the, the fact that the Bible says I've been blessed in Christ with the same blessing that Abraham had. And it said God multiplied him with silver and gold. He was a very wealthy man. So I started tithing. I started giving offerings. I started connecting my finances to my local church. I started doing everything that the Bible says. Three years ago, I had negative $233 in my bank account. Now I have a ministry and a business that produce over $100,000 a month. And it's all by the blessing of God. Okay. So by his, his justification, if everybody does that, everybody in that church should have businesses and ministries that are $100,000 a year or a month, $100,000 a month so that they can then fund the gospel at their local church too, right? I mean, that's, that's logically, if they do the same thing he does, then that should happen. Now, we all know economically, that's not how that happens. Depending on what area you're in, let's say they're in a small town in Virginia, that's just not going to happen logistically. That's not how that works. You have all sorts of things, cost of goods, inflation, local economies, all sorts of credit ratings, like all sorts of things that play into this. And so it's it's a twisting of scripture and a false gospel, really, to promise people financial wealth if all they do is follow the biblical principles. Now, if you Dave Ramsey it, which, by the way, isn't really any, I mean, Dave Ramsey is about the same thing as far as like using Bible to sell things. Dave Ramsey's principles are just logical principles. They're not biblical ones. Just don't spend more than you make. There you go. Don't spend more than you make and save some for a rainy day and do that over an amount of time, and then you'll be out of debt. There you go. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. And you say amen. So I, I don't say that to like to brag about I'm not saying it like that. I'm saying it to tell you I've been there. I've been at rock bottom. And what it means is it doesn't matter where you're at today. It's not going to be where you finish. Where you're at today will not be your tomorrow. God has a higher place for you in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? amen. I've been at rock bottom. It's not fun. But you can sow your way out. I said you can sow your way out. You don't have to stay at the bottom. Well, it was a mid-sermon up till this point. We're probably not going to be able to finish this whole thing, but we'll see how much farther we can get. Um, this dude's a joke. Pretty simple, pretty clear. Jesus will raise you up if you'll connect your finances in these last days to a mighty move of God. And I'm not, don't worry, I'm not taking an offering right now. I'm just teaching you about finances. The Lord told me everywhere that I go, that's why we do two meetings a day. He said, in the mornings, I want you to teach people about financial prosperity so that they don't stay at the same level that they're at. Because I've seen in the last six months, I've seen God 10x my finances. And what God's done for me, Grant Cardone, 10x your business. God will do for you. What God does for one, God does for anyone. Can you see? Okay, so I don't even have to speculate. He clearly just said, I'm sorry, hold on. Where's my mic? He clearly just said, that if he does it for me, he'll do it for you. So you sow and he will 10x your finances. You too will have a $100,000 income per month if you just do what Talon did. That's all you got to do. Which is no surprise to me that he sells a YouTube course. So Say amen. amen. So Jesus is coming back very soon. Number one, the devil has an antichrist agenda. A one world money system. Number two, a one world government. Look at what's happening. The United Nations, martial law. Look at everything that's happening all around the world right now. You can see how a one world military is starting to come together. A one world government. Number three, a one world military. Same thing. The Antichrist agenda is to put together a one world military to keep people locked down, to keep them afraid, to keep them out and not prospering. Look at every nation, China, North Korea, all these nations that get shut down, they become communists. What's the first book that they ban in every nation? The Bible. Why? Because the Bible teaches you that whether you be slave or free, Greek or Gentile, anything that you do for someone else, God will make happen for you. It teaches you that you're no longer a slave, but you're a free man, a free woman in Christ. The Bible teaches you that you're made in the likeness and the image of God.
So tyrannical governments are trying to get that book out of the hands of people so they can enslave people. But I prophesy in Jesus' name, you'll never be a slave. Your children will never be slaves. No government will be able to have this church in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? So you must know what the Bible says about your covenant with God in these last days. All right, uh, financial system. Number four, a one-world religion. You ever seen that stupid bumper sticker that says coexist? Yeah, yeah. Dumbest thing I've ever seen put on a car. Coexist. Absolutely absurd. You can't coexist with dumb, mute, false gods. I don't coexist with a God that doesn't exist. I serve the Most High King. His name is Jehovah. I don't coexist with devils. I don't coexist with fallen angels. Hallelujah. I serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and His name is Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen. I don't coexist. I conquer for the kingdom of light. Amen. I conquer the kingdom of darkness. I teach people about Jesus and His redemption how he died for your sins, that you no longer have to be a slave, but you can carry this same fire everywhere that you go. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. So you don't have to coexist. In fact, don't coexist. You have my permission, if you ever see one of those bumper stickers, <laughs> to go rip it off. No, don't do it. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Someone's going to catch. What are you doing? Evangelist Taylor said I could rip off this bumper sticker. <laughs> no, don't, don't do that. But if no one sees you, you can do it. No, amen. <laughs> so a one world religion. Look, at, if you study right now what's happening in Jerusalem, they have a Muslim mosque. They have a Jewish synagogue. They have a United Nations embassy. And they have all these different religions. I think a, a Roman Catholic church as well all in one radius, trying to make all the world's religions come together and coexist. No, not going to happen. Everyone say no, no. not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen in this day and age. Not until, the, not until the church has been raptured. Because the Bible says that there's a restrainer in the earth. Paul wrote in the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians, I believe. He said there's a restrainer, restraining the Antichrist agenda. Jesus is coming back soon, but there's something called the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that has all power and all authority over all the works of the devil. So the Antichrist, there's, there's, there's... There's a lot of rambling here. We're almost coming up on two hours. If you're still here, you are a champion. This is... This is almost like the Kenneth Copeland one. We're not going to go three hours, surely, but this is... Golly. More Holy Ghost power in an 80-year-old grandma than every devil that's on this planet right now. Your grandma has more Holy Ghost power in her than every form of darkness on the planet. That's why Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against. So the devil cannot prevail against the church. The devil can only have what you allow him to have. If you'll slap that guy around, give him two black eyes and a chipped tooth, then he'll never be able to touch you. I said he'll never be able to touch you. When people, I think about, oh, goodness, man. You see some of these deliverance services. They got demons everywhere. And, and, devils are very real. I've casted out my fair share of devils. But you're never going to catch me in a deliverance service. What is your name? And, and I'm going to find out every single legion. No, I'm going to say, shut your mouth and get out in Jesus' mighty name. Can you say amen? amen? See, you have so much authority over the devil, he's not even worth focusing on. He's too small to worry about. He's too small. Jesus stepped out of a boat. The moment his foot hit the ground, a man with legion in him. Someone say legion. legion. How many is that? Thousands. Thousands. Almost 6,000 devils in one man. He was so strong, he would break off chains. The moment Jesus' foot touched the earth, he ran with legion in him, broke off the chains, and fell at the feet of Jesus. And he said, have mercy on me. That's how much power is inside of you. There's not even... Okay, hold on. The reason that legion ran to Jesus is because he the legions knew that the demons knew that this was the messiah the christ they also knew what jesus could do to them this is also why they say your the appointed time has not yet come right this ties into his end times thing for some reason he's not going down that path the idea is 
that they knew that he could do whatever he wanted. And they also knew that the appointed time was not yet. And so Jesus cast them out of the man into the pig, and the man was then in his right mind. The man himself was not asking for mercy. The demons were, because they knew who Jesus was. Again, this passage is for the purpose of demonstrating the power of Jesus. Everything in the scripture is written to demonstrate the power of Jesus. Even Matthew 24 that we started off with that we're nowhere even close to now because we have went off on some random trail that has nothing to do with 24, is to tell that Jesus was able to give them the power to do things in his name. It's all about Jesus. All of it. it all of it. And the fact that we're over here talking about random stuff, just rambling on for forever. I mean, so we are one hour, 56 minutes into this particular video we're commenting on. The video itself is two hours and 33 minutes long. I don't know how much longer of this is Talon talking. Hopefully he ends soon. We'll find out. And a legion that could come against the power of the Holy Ghost inside of you. So with the restrainer still in the earth, the devil cannot fulfill his antichrist agenda yet. We still have to see a last day revival where West Virginia is shaken by the power of God, where Virginia is shaken by the power of God, where America is shaken by the power of God, where Africa is shaken by the power of God. There's still an end time move that God is raising up in this last day in this last hour. Hallelujah. And I've chosen, I'm going to be a part of it. It's like that old song, whatever you're doing, Lord, don't do it without me. Don't do it without me. Just like the prophet Isaiah said, God said, whom will I send? There's a nation that needs to hear the gospel. Whom shall I send? And he said, here I am, Lord. Send me. I want to be used. Touch my mouth. Touch my hands. Touch my heart. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Somebody say, here I am. Send me. Yeah. You have to have that heart in these last days. Okay, we've, we're hearing music, so I think we're about to end. Last days and in these last hours. Here I am, Lord. Send me. I'll be a vessel of honor for thee. In these last days and these last hours, whatever you're doing, Lord, don't do it without me. Anoint me. Anoint me to preach the gospel with power. Anoint me to lay the ha my hands on the sick and watch them recover. Anoint me to raise the dead. Anoint me to do crusade evangelism and see hundreds of millions of souls saved in this last day and in this last hour. Somebody say, use me, Lord. Say, use me, Lord. Say, anoint me, Lord. Say, fill me, Lord. Be filled with the Holy Ghost and power in this last day and in this last hour. Finally, a one world ruler. The five-fold agenda of the Antichrist system. In these last days and in these last hours, there's an antichrist agenda to bring everybody under a one world ruler. But too bad, Mr. Devil. Even my grandma's got more power of the Holy Ghost living inside of her. We got prayer warriors in this church. We've got the gates of hell that will never prevail against the church. Doesn't matter what the Antichrist agenda has in store. It will fall to pieces. Hallelujah. I said it will fall to pieces. The Antichrist won't have you. He won't have your children. He won't have your grandchildren. And he's not going to have this wonderful state of Virginia. Come on, if you're with me, stand up on your feet this morning. You've got victory. The devil's under your feet. Hallelujah. Can I pray for you? Yeah, yeah. Just step out into the aisle. I don't know if you got ushers. Just lift your hands. Begin to praise the Lord this morning. Begin to thank him out of your mouth. We don't know why he's praying for this lady. That's, that came out of nowhere. I saw that fire burning on the inside of you. How old are you? 18, turning 19. Are you going to college? You're going to carry the same fire to your college. You're going to spark revival in your college. Fire of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. Filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. Shekalabaha. Rebiana, Jay, Shaka, Robo Soko, 
Robo Soko, Robo Soko, Robo Soko, Robo Soko. My brother here, my brother here uh, with the watch and the nice shirt. Can I pray for you? Come up here. Come up here. The fire of God is here. Are you a minister? Are you in the ministry? Okay. I, I saw a new level coming on your life and on your ministry. I saw a new level. The way you received the word. Paul told the church, he said, you did not receive my word as mere men, but you received it as the word of God. You've received the word of God in your life and that word. Okay, so we're almost, we'll just say this. I'll let you know, it's stop, we're stopping at the two hour, 30 second mark. There's 33 minutes left. He's obviously done preaching, so he's going into now just calling people out of the audience based upon how they received his preaching as he watched them as he preached. So let's just cover the three things we look for every time. Did he read the scripture? Well, kind of. We didn't really read. We, he read the parts that were convenient to what he wanted to talk about, not the before and after. I think we demonstrated that as we went through. We read the before and after, and in almost every case, it didn't line up at all with what he was saying. Did he ex exegete the text as far as did he dig into context and culture? Absolutely not. And did he preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Now, this is where I have to say that I think it was like an hour and 27 minute mark in this video uh, or in the video we're watching. He mentioned uh, being saved by faith alone through grace alone, which sounded great and was really hopeful until then he connects that to all sorts of other things that um, isn't somebody being brought from death to life, isn't somebody being brought from rebellion to reconciliation. It's all connected to uh, power to heal, power over poverty power over sin but then sin is like this thing which is like instantaneous sort of freeing um so there's a lot of complications within that so he mentioned the right words but then the application of that was really weird and so i would say no all that to say i don't know a whole lot about taylor michael other than what i was told apparently he is a very big youtuber apparently he sells youtube courses apparently he flexes his money that isn't from the ministry but from other businesses i don't know anything about him other than that what i do know is what we just heard in the uh, nearly two hours where we sat here together and watched him which was that it started off as like a really mid non-exciting same old sort of stuff sermon that you could hear from basically anybody it did tell us a little bit about his theology but then when he, in the second half when he got into the application of his theology it was just trash um easily refutable by just looking at the context of scripture and so um i'm not sure whoever talked about it sin and Talon, um what what <laughs> if you like him or if you don't like him um uh, but there you go any preaching like this is the same thing that we see in every single sermon review that we do it's very easy to pull out the scriptures that they're using and then just look at them within context and see if that's what they actually say there's also some things that we can pick up on almost everybody's theology, which doesn't necessarily make it good or bad, but then we can look at the implication that they sort of unravel in the rest of the sermon based on their theology, and we can tell, at least in his case, it's all about money, it's all about um, healing, it's all about things of that nature, that when you try to connect it back to scripture, it just doesn't, it doesn't add up, it just simply doesn't add up by looking at the context. So, man, if you made it to the end... There were like four times that I would just wanted to give up on that, <laughs> but we made it through. And so I'd have to say this is probably, uh, Kenneth Copeland was like the longest, worst one we've done. Uh, Tail and Michael is a hundred percent the second uh, one that I was just like, ah, can we end this anytime soon? So if you made it this far, excellent. If you found this helpful, make sure you like it. If you're not subscribed yet, do that. And if you find out that maybe somebody, you know, would find this helpful, send it to them and we'll talk to you next week.